welcome back to Church Without a Roof. I'm Kelly, and I appreciate you being here. Are you excited for week two of the Why Worry series? I can tell you that I am. Today, we're going to take what we started last week and build on it a little bit. We're going to be taking a look at the secret of contentment. We live in a world that's filled with discontentment. Everywhere we see discontented people, we may even experience discontentment in our own lives. We wish that we could change this circumstance, or we wish that we could tweak that situation. We wish that this could be different. We wish that that could be different. But God has a great word for us today on how we can begin to experience his contentment in our lives. Let's start by taking a look at Paul's letter to the church in Philippi in chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you at last have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. When God is bringing contentment into your life, there is no reason for worry, which is what we started to talk about last week. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul wrote these words, I have learned to be content in all things. The Apostle challenges us today to live a life that is filled with contentment. You would think that somebody talking about contentment would be doing so from a sunny beach with beautiful waves, maybe a pink lemonade in their hand. The truth is that the Apostle Paul wrote these words from a prison cell, chained to a Roman guard. And it was in that context that he began to challenge us about living a life filled with contentment. In Greek, which is the language that this book of scripture is written, the word content means contained. A person who is content lives a contained life, and a person who is discontent has uncontained desires. I have to have more of this. I have to have more of that. So to be content means to live a contained life. And I want to ask you a few questions today. So please take a minute after I ask them to really think about how they apply to your own life. When people succeed more than you do, how do you feel? Do you think, man, I wish I could have what they have? Or do you think, good job, let's celebrate your success? Are you frustrated when your neighbor's kids have better things than your kids do? Here's another great question, and it's difficult to answer honestly. Do we hate people we don't even know? Did you know that we can see somebody getting out of a car or based on what they're wearing or where they're going? and we instantly don't like them. Sometimes we take those stereotypes, those quick judgments, and it really stems from discontentment in our own life. Having the power and the presence of Jesus in our life begins to bring about a sense of contentment. Here's another question. Do you struggle with the nothing is good enough syndrome? My school isn't good enough. My church isn't good enough. The restaurant service that I had last night wasn't good enough. My friends are not good enough. I just wish everything could be better. Sometimes we look around and nothing measures up to the standard that we've set. 
again, we struggle with a sense of contentment. This message is important because people are making bad decisions out of the problem of being discontent. God is the God of love. He is the God of joy. He is the God of peace. And when God is the focus of our life, he begins to change our perspective and energize us with this feeling and sense of contentment. Discontentment could be defined as feeling sadness, frustration, irritation, or disappointment with your current life situation. That's what it means to be unsatisfied. In her song, Cheryl Crow wrote a great line that says, it's not about having what you want, it's about wanting what, wanting what you've got. It's about being content. With that in mind, let's review what the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 4, verses 10 through 14. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you've had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Let me repeat one more time what Paul said. I have learned to be content in all situations. So how do we begin to have this journey of contentment? How can I change my perspective? How can I begin to experience the power and the presence of Jesus? If you're going to live a life of contentment, here's the number one action. Learn about contentment. Contentment is a learned behavior. It doesn't come by flipping a switch. It's not something you're going to get from a conference or from reading a book or even from a few experiences. Having contentment requires us to learn and to grow and to mature. That's what it says in Philippians 4.11. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Paul went through some really hard times. He had that road to Damascus experience in Acts 9. He went away after meeting Jesus for three years Paul lived in the Arabian desert. God was preparing him, getting him ready for what he had planned for Paul. And I can only imagine that spending three years in the Arabian desert was pretty boring. But it was a special place because God was preparing Paul. He was getting his heart ready for the things that he wanted Paul to carry out. He had to learn to be content. Now, the opposite of content is discontent. And people who are content in life are not envious of things that other people have. It's amazing how envy and discontent go hand in hand. When we are envious of other people, the real root is that we're not content with where we are. We wish that something could be different. But when God begins to work in our heart, when the power of Christ begins to take root, we begin to feel a sense of contentment. We're not envious of what other people have because we're focused on God and what he is doing in our life. The reality is that God blesses people with different gifts. He blesses them in different ways. And if we continuously concern ourselves with how God is blessing someone else, we are always going to be discontent. God wants to do amazing, unique, and special things in your life. It's not going to look the same as your neighbor or your coworker or your boss or the guy down the street. It is unique to you. 
Now, learning to be content is something that we have to work on. My mother is a frequent visitor to the Cayman Brac, which is a tropical island or the Caribbean Sea. And while she's there, she eats fresh local fruit, fresh fish, fresh vegetables. And if you've never experienced it, let me tell you that fresh fruit and vegetables picked daily from a tropical island is not comparable to anything that we have up here. And spending her days on the beach, getting to work remotely, having the waves lapping as she sits there, eating that delicious fare, her desires are contained. She is content. Unfortunately, the vacation ends and she has to return to the much cooler climate here with the less fantastic produce. She longs for what she is missing so much that she often spends several days eating popcorn for dinner. But Paul says, I know what it is to have a lot, and I know what it is to have a, a little. If you just had a little, you would never know what it is to have a lot. But Paul lived a life pretty high on the hog. He was a Pharisee. He was an intellectual he was educated. He was loved. He was a very important and respected member of Jewish society. Then he became a follower of Christ. He became an outlaw. He became someone that they were trying to kill. He became a prisoner. He became an inmate. But still Paul says, I know what it is to have plenty. And I know what it is to have a little. And I am content in all things. And that is what God wants for you. That's what he wants for me too. That we can learn to be content regardless of what's going on. Regardless of the circumstances. People say, well, does that mean that I have to enjoy everything that's happening in my life? Absolutely not. You can be content and be in a very difficult situation. Your heart can be breaking. You can be in the midst of an overwhelming adversity and still be content because of what God is doing in your life. You can still have that still steady power and strength and spiritual reservoir in your life that comes from Jesus. It doesn't mean that you will enjoy everything you're going through. And it doesn't mean that you get to be lazy. It doesn't mean that you can just sit around and say, well, I'm going to get a C even though I could get an A. It's not what it is to be content. We need to learn to be content while still being diligent and faithful to what God wants us to do. But we realize that the power of that contented life is based on the Lord Jesus and not on us. Even in my home church, we experience being content in uncomfortable situations. Recently, we spent several weeks with the entire congregation piled into the choir practice room for services because the main sanctuary was being repaired and remodeled. But let me remind you of this. It doesn't matter where we're worshiping God because God's going to continue to change lives. God is going to continue to impact people. A few Sundays ago, our online services reached more than 70 views. We were reaching people that we had never reached before. It doesn't matter whether they're here or they're there. We're going to be content in all things. And we're really excited about it. We're looking forward to it. We believe it's going to happen. But in the meantime, this is where we are. And we're going to be satisfied. We're going to be content with where we are today while we're keeping an eye on the future. So whether we have a lot or whether we have a little, we need to be able to take that and say, I am content in all things. Many years ago, when Alex and Jacqueline were little, those are my kids, 
I had saved all year so that I could have $200 to spend on them at Christmas. And I was so excited because I was going to be able to buy them presents that they really, really wanted. And I packed Jacqueline up in the car and we headed to the mall. She wanted to pick out her own present to get to Alex. So we pulled up in the parking lot, we get out of the car, we start to head in, and I reach into my wallet to pull out the money that I had allotted for Jacqueline. It was all gone. Someone had stolen all of our Christmas money. I had $20 to my name. So that year for Christmas, each of my children got one book and one very small toy from me. Alex got a Bakugan and Jacqueline got a single Barbie doll. The thing was that my children were so excited by their gifts that you would have thought they were in a room filled floor to ceiling with presents. They were ecstatic. They weren't concerned with what little Timmy down the street had gotten. They weren't upset that they didn't get the newest video game. They were content. Paul said, I have learned to be content in all things. So here's the second point. My level of contentment is independent of my circumstances. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. That's what Paul said in verse 11. A lot of times we think, if I could just change my relationship, I would feel content. If I could just get a better job, I would feel content. And we keep waiting for this contentment, for everything to be perfect, for everything to get aligned. But Paul said that he learned to be content no matter the circumstances. Listen, if everything in your life has to be perfect for you to be content, it is never going to happen. There is too much that is out of your control. You can't control the stock market. You can't control the economy. You can't control the weather. You can't control whether the nation goes to war. You can't control what your boss does. You can't control many, many things. The list can go on and on. But there is one thing that you can control, and that is what your heart is doing with Jesus Christ. That's why we ought to focus on Him rather than on the peripheral stuff. Because if we believe that all those things have to be in order, we're going to have a very frustrated life. But here's the beauty. When you live a life that is filled with contentment, when you're able to say with the Apostle Paul, I am content in all things. When I'm living high life or I'm struggling to get by, I can be content. When you begin to say with the Apostle Paul that you will live life that demands explanation, people who don't know the Lord will begin to ask. How could they be content in that situation while they're going through that? How can they be so calm and have so much peace when they're going through that? And people will begin to look at your life and they're going to begin to ask, where does that spiritual strength come from? Where do they get that reservoir of spiritual energy to sustain them. That's the highest honor for a Christian, that people would look at their lives and say, man, I want what she's got. Or man, I want what he's got. They've got the secret to contentment. You might think that money can solve all problems in the world, but that would mean that all lottery winners should be happy. A survey said that three years after they won the lottery, only 50% said that they were happier than they were before they'd won. And that's amazing, isn't it? 
People were winning millions of dollars and they didn't feel any happier in their life. That's because the center of contentment is Christ, not money. You see, what we need is a, not a change in our circumstances. What we need is a change inside us. We're praying for God to change all this stuff. And God is saying, I want to change you. I want to change your heart. I want to change your identity. We don't need outside props of wealth or material gains or clothes or financial security to remain happy. If we have all those things to prop us up, then we've not understood the power of Jesus Christ. You may think, but Kelly, you don't understand my life. If you knew the problems that I have, let me, let me remind you of the Apostle Paul's background. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was shipwrecked. And he was eventually jailed and stoned with stones. He went without food. He went without friends. He didn't have any money. And he was periodically chained in jail. So he went without freedom too. It wasn't like Paul had this life that was handed to him on a silver platter. It wasn't like everything was perfect and easy and luxurious. No. But Paul said, I have learned the secret of being content. He was talking about going through some really hard times. And still, the power and the presence of Jesus Christ was in his life. How does that happen? We have to understand number three. Our contentment comes from a relationship with Jesus. If you're going to have a life of contentment, it's not about your wealth. It's not about your outside props. It's not about who you know, not about the degrees you have. It's not about so many other things that we focus on. It's about knowing him. That's why in chapter 3, verse 10, the apostle says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. When you focus on knowing Christ, you aren't focused on having things. You aren't focused on the bigger office or where your name is printed or whatever everybody thinks about you. You are focused on something different. Notice in chapter 3 that he says, I want to know Christ. But then in chapter 4 he says, For I can do everything God asks me to do with the help of Christ who gives me strength and power. You see, the knowing comes before the being. I want to have a certain experience. It comes out of knowing. A lot of times we think, well, I want the five easy steps to a contented life. Maybe you read a book or an article about it, but the Bible says it's about knowing Christ. Because when you are knowing Christ, it doesn't matter what's going on with all the other stuff. God is the only one who is consistent in the universe. We are trying to build our lives around all these things that are constantly changing that we have no control over. But God is steady and sure and strong and he is always the same. He is unchanging. And that's why living a contented life is to know Christ. If we base our life on the circumstances, the ups and the downs, we're going to be emotionally unstable all over the place, upset, frustrated, whatever it may be. Meeting and knowing are different 
Philippians 4.13 says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. This is one of the most misquoted verses in scripture. Even if you're not a Christian, you have probably heard it, but a lot of times we take it out of context. We pull it out of what's going on in Philippians 4, but verses 11 and 12 say that they are talking about contentment. I've learned to be content in all things. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. The context is not about winning a football game. It's not about being summa cum laude. It's not about being CEO. That's not what the Bible is talking about. It's talking about being content in all things. And when you begin to read Philippians 4.13 in the context of what's going on. You see that God wants us to be content in all scenarios. That we are capable of doing so when our eyes are focused on Jesus Christ. The verse is about doing whatever God has called us to do. I love the Living Bible paraphrase. For I can do everything God asks me to do with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and power. You know why a lot of people are so frustrated? Because they're trying to do a bunch of stuff that God has never told them to do. They wonder, why am I so disappointed? Why am I so upset? Why do I feel so negative? If we begin to align ourselves, it will look more like this. Whatever God calls us to do, God will give us the strength to do. If God calls you to get a degree, he's going to give you the strength to get a degree. If God calls you to be a spouse, he's going to give you the strength to be a spouse. If he calls you to be a parent, he's going to give you the strength to be a parent. Whatever God is going to call you to do, he is going to give you the strength to accomplish that task. So be encouraged. If we begin to focus less on the things we want to do and more on the things that God wants us to do, I wonder how it would begin to change our experience. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 gives us a little bit more flavor. My gracious favor is all that you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may work through me. When you are weak, that's when you're strong. People who think they're strong don't see their need for God and for God's strength and for God's power. God's power does not work in their lives. When you are weak, you are actually stronger. When you feel vulnerable and you're being exposed, when you feel uncertain, that's the moment that God begins to work a miracle in your life by giving you the power and the strength that you need to carry on. Second Peter 13 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life, for godliness, through our knowledge of Him. Do everything that God has called you to do. He's going to give you the strength to do it. To live a godly life. To be that person of contentment. To follow through with the things that he has put on your heart. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that works within us. The power is the power of the resurrected Christ. It's all about knowing him. If you want to live a contented life, your life needs to be focused on Jesus Christ. If you want to live a life of discontentment, focus on yourself. It's your choice. It's a choice that we all have to make. Are we going to focus on negativity, selfishness, our own appetites? Or are we going to focus on God and godly things? 
God wants us to be able to say, I have learned to be content in all things. God wants us to learn to be content in all things. And we do so through the power of Jesus Christ and focusing on him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you give us the ability to be content. You fill our heart in ways that nothing in this world could do. Help us to take the steps, Lord, to learn to live a contented life. Help us to grow and mature through focusing on Jesus. All these things are possible through you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I hope that your week will be filled with the peace and blessing of God, and I'll see you next week.